Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're hailing from. Welcome to another episode of OpenShift.tv, another show about Windows tools for OpenShift. I'm joined by two of my favorite Red Hatters, Christian Hernandez and Andrew Sullivan. And I only said it in that order because I did it in alphabetical order last time. So boom. So please, I am Chris Short. I work at Red Hat. I'm a CNCF ambassador. I'm on the OpenShift team. Uh, Andrew, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself since, you know, you're Andrew and Cuddly and stuff. So I don't mind being your second favorite behind Christian. That's a, <laughs> yes. I, I, that's a worthy fight to lose. Yeah. That, um, yeah. So I am a technical marketing manager, uh, same team as Chris. So we are the cloud platforms business units, technical marketing team responsible for uh, mostly OpenShift, although there's a little bit of Red Hat virtualization and OpenStack and some various other things mixed in amongst us. Uh, but as Chris mentioned at the top or at the start here, today we'll be talking about Microsoft Windows. So this, this could be interesting. Yes. Could? Uh, bunch, yeah. <laughs> bunch, bunch, of, bunch of Linux guys talking bunch about Windows. Bunch of Linux Windows. and, you know, <laughs> hacker nerds working on Windows. Oh, boy. Here we go. Here we go. What's the worst that can happen? Yeah. Sun is shining. So, wind is blowing. Well, what's funny is the, the reason we wanted to talk about this is that we get uh, kind of a little insight for everyone a little inside, a little back um, behind the scenes news here is that well, we get uh, statistics from our blogs, right? So we get um, statistics coming about every week, I think the report comes out, yeah. um, or at, le at least the report comes to us every week. And Windows tools for OpenShift has been like consistently like number one, number two, the top five, right? Since um, the original one was posted, right? It, it, it kept hitting um the top five and we realized we haven't actually really talked about um people had um using windows as a client to interface with openshift but that's probably like the bulk of our users right the enterprise users you're either on a mac or uh, or a pc and for most enterprises you're on actually on on the windows uh on the windows host so um so a little li little background there for you is, is why we're doing this windows uh stream yeah, and if you're if you've seen this blog post before, or if you have good eyes on the screen that I'm sharing right now, you can see that uh, I was the sucker who updated it. Um, no, I'm I'm <laughs> kidding. Um, so my background, I was a customer for a long time, um, and as a customer and the environments that I worked in, I always used Windows. Right, I, I didn't have a choice. Windows yeah. was the only option I had, and it was domain joined Windows at that. Um, with all the all the fun, um, uh, yeah, all yeah. the appropriate security lockdowns and everything else, right? Administrator access is is forbidden, right? It's all of those things. Uh, so, you know, it, as Christian mentioned, this post was consistently in the top five after it was two or three years old, I think. Um, yeah, about two years old, three years old. Um, you know, it came up of, hey, we should really update this, and I I looked at it and took the approach of, well. I'm going to assume that most of you, even though you're Linux administrators, even though you're OpenShift administrators, are not Windows desktop administrators or not given permissions to be a Windows desktop administrator um, anyways. So as I was going through updating this, I tried to do it as much as possible. Um, and, and I think I was successful entirely uh, without needing any sort of administrator privileges on your desktop for any, any of those steps. Nice. So... Yeah, that ho hopefully I was successful. I'm pretty sure I was because it worked on my desktop. Um, now, <laughs> that being said, yeah, it, it works. And it's me. containers, so <laughs> yeah. totally. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Um, so that being said, for this particular live stream, I have commandeered my uh, my middle child, my oldest daughter's desktop. Um, so this is a Windows 10 so desktop. It is not domain joined. Um, so, but you should see, right, if I try to do something that requires admin privileges, it'll still come up, it'll still UAC, um, you know, it'll still go through the normal prompts. It'll, it'll freak out. Yeah. And the goal here is not that I want to literally go step by step through the blog post and show you what's happening here, but really just to explore what it's like to be an OpenShift administrator that is on a Windows desktop. Yeah, um, which as I'm sure always, a lot of administrators find themselves, you know. Yeah, and, and as always, please feel free to ask questions in the comments. Um, I will trust these guys to uh, oh, yeah, to keep me you. honest and and all of that. 
Chris uh, threatened me with a with a backup Windows desktop in case something happens to this one. So, oh yeah, we'll yeah, see yeah, what yeah. happens. I got you. <laughs> I think it was first first right threat here. via Windows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, first things first. Uh, so I Microsoft and I don't remember what version it was. At some point, Microsoft um, you know switched the default console or the default terminal inside of Windows to PowerShell. Mm -hmm. um, so anybody who has known me for any length of time, um, I, I'm a PowerShell person. I, I used PowerShell for many, many years. Um, I was at one point many years ago, um, I like to think I was savvy with PowerShell, um, particularly when it came to doing things like administering VMware environments, um, doing things like that. So uh, Wait, what you'll what, notice- Didn't you RTFM? I don't know. He actually W. You, didn't you write a book about? He, he actually. Power so Shell? Andrew. So Andrew's a little, uh, a little timid, but um, <laughs> or a little humble. He uh, actually wrote the book on PowerShell. Actually, he wrote a, a book um, a, talking about a, interfacing PowerShell with, um, with via uh, vSphere. A uh, book. So he's he wrote a book, not the book. He wrote a book. I mean, it yeah. could be the book. Co. Co. Be I was a co-author, but still. Yeah. Well, you. You know, anytime I have a PowerShell question, you're like the first person I ping. So you're now, I guess, <laughs> PowerShell, in the line of the blind. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, virtualization. That's, that's another one. Definitely. Well, th thank you, and and I will try and wash those bus tire tracks off off my back. Uh, <laughs> still, yeah. Um, yes, very true. I, I was a co-author of one of the um, Power CLI reference books. Um, I don't remember which one now. It's behind me somewhere, um, or I guess it's on this side. So um, yeah, I, I am. I'm a PowerShell person. I've used it for many years. Um, Microsoft switched the default over to um, PowerShell some time ago. Um, so on this particular desktop, I'm running PowerShell seven, and I'm running it inside the new Windows terminal. Um, which oh the fancy I, new one that you got on the Windows yeah. Store yeah nice which I have to say I really like this this terminal it's super okay. fancy it's super nice um, I haven't tried it yet so I'm yeah, curious to get your feedback I, I have no complaints about it whatsoever um, dang you can see I can do things like open an Azure Cloud shell directly from inside of here if I oh choose gosh, to that's, um, wow I, so that's I, awesome I, you, know, you can go the, back the new, to the you can go back to the, the old general, way right? yeah this yep. is the new hotness that they released. Like Scott nice. Hanselman was talking yeah. about it months ago, kind of thing as beta. Yeah, and it it does the dynamic resizing and all that other stuff. So very oh, much like the Linux nice, terminal, nice. terminal, right? If you have something that wraps and then you widen the window, mm -hmm. it'll unwrap it and all that other stuff. Yeah, it's nice. Oh, yay! Okay, good. So, um, so I have PowerShell seven. Um, just FYI, PowerShell seven is shipped as a MSI, or you can install it from the store. Um, Currently, the default version of PowerShell is still 5. something. Um, do note that at, uh, PowerShell 6, PowerShell 7 do work in Linux as well. Um, so if you happen to be a PowerShell person, PowerShell fan, you can use PowerShell from inside of Linux, inside of a container even. I think I can brew install PowerShell too. I'm not sure. I forget. Yes. Yeah, yeah you absolutely can. Yeah. Um, so I also have my internal um, cluster here that I need to find the link to very secure with your duck duck go i see so this uh, is literally your uh using brave <laughs> your, using your duck, duck, duck go like duck, yeah duck go. You, you, wow <laughs> yeah you can see it doesn't even let you go to the console so secure. i know well notice <laughs> it it's a, a lab.lan url so it ah. says i don't know what this is i'm going to search instead <laughs> of course so this is my internal cluster to that I use for all of my demos and stuff like that. Anybody who's seen me demo anything before has probably seen this cluster. Um, so I'm using this because this will be our example cluster. This is, will be the one that I'm connecting to and doing actions against throughout. And then the last thing that I need is to go to cloud.redhat.com because I need access to all of our different resources. And you can get one of these accounts for free by heading over there. It says create one now right underneath this block. Uh, or you just went to cloud.redhat.com. Um, and you can get off and running just like Andrew is. So this is, yep. there was an interesting 
so I, I am a um, Linux admin, always use Linux for everything, even my desktop. So someone in the chat mentioned something called Cobra. Um, I don't know if you know what that is, Andrew. If you could expand is on that. Is that a Windows list. thing? Or? Well, apparently it's a... Uh, it would be nice if Cobra know. full support PowerShell completion. Which Cobra? <laughs> There's a lot of things called a, Cobra. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if it, it's a... Well, is like Cobra like the... Like, uh, the, the language? The guys? <laughs> <laughs> not that. <laughs> no, not that guy? It looks like, yeah, it might be the language. Cobra You're talking about PowerShell in... and Cobra. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. So that so is one thing that I, I did some, uh, I did a little bit of background research. Um, so I know who SPF 13 is. Before this around whether or not there are PowerShell modules for Kubernetes, et cetera. Um, so, you know, can you get the native PowerShell experience interacting with uh, Kubernetes? And I, I wasn't able to find anything official um, or you, there was a couple of very unofficial, very um, kind of not complete looking things out there that I didn't want to subject myself nor the world to, um, mm. although I'm, I'm sure that they would be uh, perfectly functional. So when we look at, even though I'm in the PowerShell terminal here and everything else, when we're looking at the uh, OpenShift command line tools, whether they're OpenShift or Kubernetes command line tools, um, they are going to be kind of the native compiled, right? They're written in Go, et cetera. Uh, so unfortunately, what that means is I can't pipeline if I'm talking, you know, if I'm using PowerShell, I can't pipeline as easily as I would want to. I would have to wrap it. I would have to do like string extraction and all kinds of other stuff like you would in Bash. Um, so not, not as fun as I would like. You know, I would love to be able to have objects, you know, PowerShell objects for each one of those um, Kubernetes things. Kubernetes objects um, and being able to pipeline those around would be just phenomenal, but it's not there. At least not that I could find. If anybody knows differently, I would be very, very interested. Yeah. And we'll, I'll happily share it out, you know? Yeah. Um, so all I've done here, I went to cloud.redhat.com. I went to the OpenShift page. I clicked on install. I selected a random infrastructure. Uh, and really what I'm looking for here is this link, this download command line tools. And I am using Windows, but really what I want is the link address. Um, and the reason I want that is because this is actually a directory that we can browse, right? So I can come in here and I can look and I can see all of the different tools that are inside of here. Uh, being Windows, of course, I'm going to want to download the Windows zip, um, which I will go ahead and kick that off now. Yes, go ahead and save. Uh, but I can also go up a directory and I can see all kinds of different, all the various releases, all the other stuff that's going on inside of here. I'm not terribly interested in that at the moment, um, but rather what we want is all of the other tools. Uh, so this is my secret method of finding, right, the, the quick and easy way to all of our command line tools, all of our other stuff. So you see each one of these projects has a top level directory in here. So for example, if I want ODO, I select the ODO directory latest, and then we see we have access to all of our downloads. Uh, you can, of course, um, so the official way of finding all of these things is to go to the docs, or at least the official way I use when I use the official way. Um, go to the docs here, and if we scroll all the way down to, you know, pick whatever one of these I want, so CLI tools, and then ODO, I can go to installing ODO, and you see here it has links to each one of these that I want to do. So if I scroll down to Windows, it says download the latest file and it has a link over to that file. Um, so one thing to note here is that the documentation takes a very safe route of, you know, you see they're saying create a folder at, you know, C, at the root level of your C drive of go bin. Again, not everybody has permissions there, um, in addition right. to which it's not going to be in your path. So they very generically just say, add the path variable to your, or the variable into your path. And, you know, they don't always provide thorough directions. Um, additionally, I wanted to try and be conscious of things like roaming profiles. Um, right. So if you want to put it into your, you know, your documents directory or something like that, so that it's a part of your roaming profile, you can. Um, I would not recommend doing that with code ready containers, however, because it's like two gigabytes in size and your admin team will hate you. 
Um, but otherwise, yeah, there's nothing wrong with putting them in there. I think the directions that I have in the blog post put it outside. It's still in your profile so that if your admin team has something that goes through and periodically cleans up user profiles, it'll still get wiped that way, um, but it is not part of the roaming profile. Okay, all of that stage set. Um, I'll get to these other tools here in just a moment. Um, but the core of what I want to do here is quite simply unzip our file. And 7-zip extract here. 7-zip, did you, did you remember to pay for it? Which one was the one, <laughs> the one that like you're supposed to pay for it, but like if you didn't, it still worked? This was you never had to pay Windows. for WinZip, I think it was. I don't remember. No, no, I'm talking about like Windows, like 90, like yeah, that's what I mean, right? Like WinZip, the actual was it WinZip? Oh, I think, yeah. okay, I think it was like it WinZip. always gave you a prompt, hey, you could pay us, yeah, you yeah, exactly. You're past yeah. your expiration, you know, you're past your 14 day trial or whatever, but you could continue to use it no matter what, yeah. I see somebody asking about increasing the browser font spies, so oh, I'm so doing yes. that now, please. And Sorry, I didn't call you out on that. Hopefully it Win will rar. carry across WinRAR, yeah. WinRAR is the one I was like, thinking about. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, did the same so thing. So I've used 7-Zip for years. I actually, um, when I install a new Windows desktop, I use a tool called Ninite. Um, so it's a, a pretty simple thing. You go through, you select all the things that you want to install, put a checkbox for each one, um, click the download, it'll give you an executable, and hit it and it downloads and installs everything for you. Look look at all those wares. And you can wow. You can continually <laughs> use the same executable and it'll just go through and update each one of the tools. So, oh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Never heard Dang. that. Dang. Okay. So well, like you're getting hacker hacker news here from from Andrew. Yeah, that's awesome. I am bookmarking that for sure. Because for the longest time, it did not have a Windows box. But then suddenly I started live streaming and I needed a Windows box for certain things. And for the first time in ages, I have a Windows box at my house. So yeah, this would be very helpful. So uh, you can see I downloaded OC. It's in the downloads directory. I extracted it into its own directory here. And I can, of course, CD into this directory and I can do the standard dot slash, um, you know, OC. And it will give me all of the options, all of the things that I need, right? I can do a, um, you know, follow the standards. Oops, control U doesn't work in Windows. I always forget that. Um, so all of the things that I need, I can come here, log in again. If we take this guy, another thing that works well with this uh, client is copy and paste. Works as expected. Uh, so oh, you see, I can't I... just copy and paste, right? I need to do the dot slash OC dot EXE. And yes, insecure. So now I can use the, again, dot slash OC, you know, get node. So it's kind of obnoxious constantly having to provide either a, an absolute or a rel rel relative, can't talk today. Uh, path in order to access all of my resources. Mm. So instead, what we want to do is put it somewhere inside of my folder, inside of my um, particular set of documents. So if we look at our user directory, there is a hidden object or a hidden folder for app data. Um, so if you didn't know, this is where Windows keeps all kinds of user information relating to all of your different you know, applications, programs, et cetera. Uh, you can see that we have this local, local, low, and roaming. Roaming, of course, being a roaming profile. Um, this is the folder that would be replicated around with roaming desktops or roaming profiles in Active Directory, um, whereas local is not. Um, so quite simply, I'm going to create a new folder inside of here. So Control-Shift-N is the shortcut for that. I'm going to do Red Hats. Um, no space because I see that most of these others don't have spaces. There's one or two, but um, even though it makes me twinge a little bit not having the space in Red Hat. Um, and then from there, all I want to do is copy my downloaded file in there. Um, 
if we go here, and simply drag it across. So first of all, we can see inside of here, it's gone from there. I can also go back to my home directory and now I can do oc.exe. Oh, it's not in my, uh, my environments. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, uh, so now that it is in a common location, skip the step. I did. Now that it is in a common location, I want to add it to my environment. Um, so there's a couple of different ways of doing that. And if we look at our blog post, I documented um, three of the most common ones. So the first one is adding it quite simply to this PowerShell session. Um, so all I'm doing here, so dollar sign a e and v accesses our environment variables, colon path is the specific one that I want. I'm going to append to that variable semicolon local app data red hat open shift. Um, so you can see I did not um, use the same path. So I can also do quite simply things like env path uh, to see the current path. You can see that there's a bunch of things inside of there. I can also do local app data and see which particular folder that is referring to. Um, if, if you do just go ahead. Like does dollar sign env give you the same kind of output like env on the, a Linux desktop would? No, okay, never mind. I was hopeful. <laughs> there is a way to enumerate those. I don't remember it off the top of my is it, head. Is it like colon star maybe? I don't know. I forget. Someone in chat will probably pop up with it. Yeah, so the PowerShell ISE will, will give you a whole list of them. Um, it, it reads into those and you, it'll help you do the predictive selecting. I just, I don't remember the command off the top of my head uh, to enumerate them. Um, I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot there, my bad. But... No, no, you're good. So all I'm going to do here is copy my path here into my uh, or append the path that I just added that file to, so local app data Red Hat, uh, and append it to my path. So for this PowerShell session right here, I can now do oc.exe, um, and you can see it gives me all of the things that I have. So still retains nice. my session and everything. But if I create a new session, and you want to do it. our standard blow it up, right, oc.exe, and it's gonna say, nope, not there. So that's fine, right? You can work around that and have basically that command executed every time by adding it to the uh, uh, PowerShell profile. So if you're not familiar with the PowerShell profile, this is kind of like a bash RC, right? Or a, a ZSHRC or, or whatever that happens to be. It is a it's file, a file that is, okay. right. yep, it is executed. It's sourced every time you open a new PowerShell session. Um, so you can see all I'm doing in this particular command is saying, add what I just executed up here as, you know, to the end of that file. Um, so that every time a new PowerShell session is started, it's there. So that's good and bad. Um, so one, it's, it's good because, well, if I'm banging away on the command line, great. It's bad because if I have a script that is being executed automatically, so I've got a scheduled task or something like that, it's not going to get, it's not going to pull that in, right? It's only, it's only executed when I open a PowerShell session. So if I have, you know, like powershell.exe, this.ps1, that doesn't get read. So the way around that, or the, the most robust way of doing it is to actually add it to your environment variable. Uh, so I documented here how to do it programmatically. Um, if you don't want to do it programmatically, um, I understand blindly executing other people's code. Uh, the way to do it is a little bit hokey and it always takes me a while to remember NAN Windows 10. Um, you would think I would remember this after doing it a bunch of times, but but no. I, yes, I mean, it's like yeah. Chrome bash, right? Like we tell everyone not to do it, but I end up doing it anyway. <laughs> you're not supposed to admit that christian yeah you're supposed, oh, supposed sorry. to that I mean, to yourself uh, i mean I, I never do it um so you saw what i did there um so I, all i did here was uh, i right clicked on the start menu went to system it pops up this settings menu and then i went to system info which pops up this particular one 
Um, and then this says advanced system settings. It, it has the little UAC icon next to it. It won't actually UAC unless you do certain actions in here. Um, so if I go to this advanced tab, um, so this is where I could, for example, change the name of my computer, right? Um, if I wanna do things like disable um, the uh, system restore points, et cetera, um, this is how I turned on remote desktop. Anyways, so we have this environment variables. You can see by clicking that, I can edit my users variables as well as system level variables. Uh, so remember system variables will apply to every user across the entire system. User variables are only my user. Uh, so I can go in here, I can hit edit and add a new path. And I will use the same path that I use over here. We'll copy that guy. Copy what? <laughs> You're gonna copy what? I'm gonna copy that guy. Copy copy that string. That there string. you go. <laughs> <laughs> so one one thing to note here, this won't actually work as I've copied it um, because this is a PowerShell environment variable, and you can see it's using the old command style. Um, you can simply do substitute that with percent local app data percent. Oh, cool. And we can validate that that is correct by copying it. We'll hit OK first. And if I do a run and just paste that in there, it'll open up that particular folder. Uh, you could also, from a command prompt, so if I open old school commands, and again, we'll make it bigger so everybody oh, can yeah. read it. Old school. And if we do an echo on that, it'll echo out that particular variable, so. Cool. And I keep trying to hit the uh, the Mac OS super up so I can see all of the windows tiled up and that doesn't work very well. In Across in remote particular. desktop? No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, I've added into my path, I've added my particular uh, environment variable. So I hit okay a couple of times here and we'll exit out of all these two sessions and open up a new one. And now, Assuming everything went according to plan, we should have our, and it didn't. So let's see. I love it when it breaks. That's everything goes according what to plan. What happens? Did you, is this the Did new session? Did you have to log out and log back in? I don't think I have to log out and log back in. Or maybe um, close the window? I don't know. I, I bet it's having to close the window. I bet you're right. Mm -hmm. I remember this correctly. And I always thought PowerShell was blue. Um, that's yeah. the other one. <laughs> oh, oh, the okay. other, other one? <laughs> the other, other one. So if I just bring up this yeah, PowerShell. The, OK. Yeah. There we go. That's the one I'm used to seeing. Oh, OK. So, this is the, the new Windows window thingy. OK. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. So if we look at this, this is also PowerShell version 5.1 as opposed to uh, 7.03. And then this is the Windows terminal. Um, so I can still, just to round it out here. I can still open up in this. Um, this is kind of the same. So, but yeah, nice. it did change from blue to black. Cool. I guess black is cooler or something. Not as cool as red, but it's something. It's something. All right, there we go. So very much to your point, and thank you for the reminder, um, Christian, of I did need to actually close out of the window, um, which is the Microsoft terminal window. Um, had I been using the other, like had I tried with either of the ones that I just brought up, it would have worked as expected. Um, so Microsoft's terminal, this new fancy thing, um, was what was preventing that from working. Hmm. So at this point, um, I can do my uh, oc.exe, and I can do also need, do tab completion. Do you need the exe? Yes. Um, okay. At least I think so. Let's check. Oh, no, I don't. Now that it's in the path. Oh, cool. Nice. It's even better. Yeah. It's even more native. <laughs> we'll come back over here. And now, if I just paste my OC login commands, it just works. Now you're open shifting with Windows. So now I have that same OC experience across both. Um, I, I, 
it's not bash, which means that you don't have the same text manipulation, right? I would still need to pipe into like a, and unfortunately, even though this is PowerShell, things like where doesn't don't work. Um, mm. Remember, each one of these isn't a object; it's one string. So, grepping and stuff like that to find an individual line, you're still in Windows. Um, there's probably a workaround for that. Um, if I had to guess, there's got to be like a Windows equivalent of grep. grep. Um, yeah. But I don't know off the top of my head. Got me. So. This is where you have to learn the uh, JSON path really well. <laughs> if you want to, <laughs> if you want to grab individual components. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish you know I could pipeline into like uh, you know where dash object, um, like you know an underscore dot See, now, name equals. Now, uh, Andrew is. Uh, but it doesn't, <laughs> yeah. it, it doesn't it oh, doesn't work it? because there is no there is no properties associated with each one of those right got it so inside of powershell so where dot object is basically a select right and then inside of the loop dollar underscore is referring to the current object the current iteration and then this would be a property on that particular object so going back to the conversation before of if we had native PowerShell, you know, object extensions for Kubernetes, then this would absolutely be phenomenal and we could interact with it in that way. Um, but instead, this output is treated as a single string. Uh, there's some, I see uh, somebody saying fine string is the Windows grep. Um, so after this, now that we kind of have these preliminaries set up, which is really more or less creating the folder um, over here, and then adding that in variable to the path, um, at this point, it's more or less just going through and downloading all the different tools. Yeah, so now you can just basically pop in ODO, you can pop in kubectl, you can pop in pretty much exactly any tool set, right? So it's like a one-time setting. Exactly. So from here, right, I'm going to go into my folder here that I downloaded or that I put this in before. And Red Hat, and I could just save this inside of here. So one thing I will do is as it downloads, I'm going to rename it to just ODO instead of all of those other extensions. You can see it downloaded. I, I can tell this is your kid's laptop because I see Fortnite. Folder. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, there's uh, so there's ODO. Yeah, there's Fortnite. There's Star Stable. There's Roblox. There's there's all kinds of stuff. I just want um, all the old games to work on my new hardware. <laughs> uh, use uh, uh DOSBox. Uh, mm, mm. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's true. So there's ODO. Um, so here, let's go and grab, you know, Helm. We can do the same thing here. Yeah, so unfortunately, the only Windows tool that doesn't work or the only tool that doesn't work in Windows is OpenShift install. Um, I, I, I wish I had an answer for that. I wish I had a way to get OpenShift install to work on Windows um, to kind of complete all of those requirements, all the things that are needed. Um, but unfortunately, I just, I don't. Well, hmm, okay. So yeah, it is but, I mean, Mac, everything Mac else. OS. Yeah, it is Mac OS or, or Linux only. Um, but yeah, everything else works as expected. Um, going back to what I was saying before about uh, code ready containers, just be aware that you see this is a 2.2 gigabyte compressed file. Um, so if you stick that into your roaming profile, your admins will probably be upset with you as well as your yeah. login times will take forever. Forever, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, someone mentioned we need a chocolatey package for ODO. Um, so I saw some conversation about chocolatey recently, and yeah. I, the last I saw was we weren't sure who was creating and maintaining the chocolatey right. package. Um, yeah. So I don't know if that was created by a third party or if it was created by a Red Hatter who has since forgotten about it. Um, but yeah. We should, we should probably figure that out. Um, we should probably yeah. move back in on A that. A great yeah. mystery. <laughs> well, also, I think it's the same with brew, right? Like, if you brew install, like, OpenShift clients, 
the Brew install installs OpenShift, the OC client version 4.1. So that means whoever originally created it is oh. maintaining it. <laughs> ah. Because we're because we're on four five, soon to be four six. Four six, um, yeah. Yeah, four um, I think four dot one's deprecated, so so it's yeah, even it is. Yeah. <laughs> so it's Just even had Mike on on Monday <laughs> to remind yeah. folks. So yeah, unfortunately, and you can see Windows directory only oc.zip. If I go to you know Linux, oh this is because I'm in clients. Um, so if I go up a couple of directories here, and I go to to pull up a couple of directories, the most wondery directory. Actually, of all. now I've confused myself. I don't know where I'm going. Um, yeah, you're looking for not not. What are you? Looking? You're not looking for Fortnite. Yeah, there we yeah. go. I'm not looking <laughs> for o OC. I'm looking for OCP. And now we have our OpenShift install. You can yeah. see we just have OpenShift install and OpenShift client. Um, there is no install for Windows. Cool. So as I was pointing out before, if we switch over to our Red Hat directory here, um, I will quickly extract this guy. Twice, mm. because it's a tar file and I wasn't paying attention. They say, can you not have ODO as a Python library? ODO, I thought was Go. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think it's a. I don't think you could do like um, pip install ODO. Oh, 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 yeah. No, I don't think so. There, I I cheated and I just opened the. Cheater, cheater, pumpkin eater. Opened it instead of trying to do it the other way. And I always do a pip install for globally too. I want to talk about bad habits. Yeah, no <laughs> kidding. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm the only one that's going to use this box. So <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> I mean, let's face it. Um. Oh, the other one that we want to grab is Kube Cuddle, um, or Kube Control, or however you want to. However you prefer to say it today. Yeah, this is how do I feel like today? <laughs> today, Kubectl. Cool. I've heard Kubectl. QBXL, QBCTL, yeah. QBE, yeah. QB someone spelled the whole thing, QBECTL. So one That's thing to note, I don't remember if, I don't think that it is included in this. Yeah, this just includes OC. So we basically so were expecting to folks to go to Kubernetes to download yeah, QBCTL. I think I always just Google for it. QBCTL Windows download, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so super complex um, let me actually use the menu here and not just randomly browse well you know i mean yeah, i like watching browse tuesday, the right? internet yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was what you're doing on tuesday so yeah and you can see there's a bunch of different ones here anyways right. it's cool Kube cuddle, it works exactly as expected inside of all of these. Um, you know, my uh, the goal here was to show that it's straightforward. It's easy to get all of these tools set up on your Windows desktop without being an administrator, and have that same administrator experience, with the exception of installation, uh, which does unfortunately require a Linux desktop. Although you should be able to use the um, the the uh, now I forgot what it's called. What's the Linux thing in Windows. W, the WSL. W, WSL. Yeah, that was that was going to be my question. I forget what it. That, Windows system subsystem for Linux. For yeah. Linux. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, then so, they have WSL two now. So I was I was wondering what the um, when you would use one for the other, but I guess you would use uh, this method when you, when you don't have an admin, right? Yeah. So uh, right. to my knowledge, um, you know, interacting with folks, talking with customers. Um, there's not a lot of enterprises that are allowing WSL. Um, you know, it just doesn't have the same controls. It doesn't have the same mm -hmm. ability to, you know, lock Can't down, lock down yeah. yeah, that WSL uh, environment okay. the same way that you can the rest of Windows. So it, it's not common, um, but you oh, okay. could so you use that. Like, yeah. You can't control it with like uh, group policy or something like that, which Apparently is probably not, why. I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So, yeah, you, I mean, you Path can control. manipulation on Windows, I think faced many problems with that before i think is what this says yeah 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 and um you can have uh, like if if you're administ if you are an administrator or if you have like a separate um group policy or user mm -hmm. policy for like an administrator team etc 
you can always push out all of these tools. You can update their path automatically, right. all using group policy. Yeah. Um, I mean, these are tools we provide. Like Red Hat provides these tools for you to use on Windows machines. So you can totally add this to your you know, yep. group install for OpenShift admins or container admins, whatever you want to call them. Gotcha. Okay, cool. So like if I'm um, just at home, sitting at home, I would probably use WSL or WSL2. Um, on an enterprise, though, I may not have that flexibility of just yeah, you installing might, a, a Linux VM, right? Yeah, like you I, might I end up to... using Hyper-V or a VMware you know, box, maybe something like that. So uh, honestly, and, and this is something I would be curious about from the audience, which is most of the enterprises I have either worked for or worked with, the data center is strongly isolated from the rest of the environment. Um, so oftentimes it requires, you're already either VPNing or otherwise connecting securely into that environment, um, right. or there there is no direct connection without a lot of you know bureaucracy around firewall exceptions, et cetera. Mm. So many times it, you end up with a bastion host regardless. Yeah, um, and and using that as as you know a Linux based bastion host to run OpenShift install to run the rest of the commands from. Um, for administrative purposes, from a developer perspective, from a user perspective, um, I think the OC command running from Windows, right, port 443 access or 6443 accessing the API, um, you know, pretty straightforward from a, an exception standpoint. Yeah, it's because I've worked with customers who've had things pretty isolated. And yeah, I've worked. You're with right, Andrew. Like the financial they services. Work. Yeah, they yeah, have exactly. Financial a bastion box that I'm always jumping through somehow. Or like Citrix, right? Like they will like open up a Citrix session. Yeah that connects them to a client that then connects them to um, the uh, production environment or the development environment. Um, and then so, there's the other side where it's like a completely disconnected environment where you could go into like a whole nother area to interface with it. Even then there's still Bastion host to some extent, right? So yeah, I see Paris mentioning DSC, right? There's also PS remoting and all of that other fun stuff. Um, Again, a lot of that varies based off of the security team, the Windows team, and whether or not they're accessible. Um, but it's also an option to do that whole hopping around through the data center or into secure enclaves. Does anyone happen to have an answer for Vinay Venu here? While I'm using S2I for a Java source code and Git with OpenShift, I'm getting this error, Ben SH, user libexec S2I assemble not found. That's I'm curious where you're doing that. Yeah. Yeah, because that, uh, that should be S because that should be built into the S2I image. Image that, itself. Yeah. Yeah, because the assemble is actually part of the S2I process. So what is the source image? I'm guessing is might be at the issue here. Yeah, the source image, the 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 image you're using for S2I. Yeah. Whatever it is, there's something wrong with it, or. Um, there's something like not version. configured right with it to get yeah that because piece. assemble i think is the second step in s2i um there's like three or four yeah. steps s2i and like assembles like very early on um in the yeah. in the process so yeah i'm just so a I simple would... fake windows administrator I, I yeah i don't <laughs> yeah i mean i know this probably isn't windows related but i'm not a s2i expert either i feel like uh, I could drop that to Jason Dobies though real quick yeah. and see if he can give me an answer. Another guy who has another book. Yes, which I have <laughs> uh, actually, yeah. Although so he's you, offline. But so, you have, so you have Dobies' book, but not Andrew's book. Andrew's book's six years old. Oh, okay. <laughs> Someone sent me Dobies' book, by the way. Oh, okay, I didn't okay, like, gotcha. like, I asked for it and it was sent to me. Gotcha. Andrew, could someone send me your book? Yeah, there you go. do you have a box of books? <laughs> you have a uh, box of books. <laughs> I wanted autographed as well. I gave away all the ones I had. Two yeah, now that makes sense. When it was published, but they were yeah. all given away. Yeah, no. So I have an autographed copy by every author of the DevOps Handbook. I think. Uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. But I would love to have an autographed copy of an Andrew Sullivan book someday. And Christian Hernandez. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. One day, one day I'll, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll write a book. Um, yeah, we all will one day, <laughs> one day. So, uh, question, uh, there's no question in, in chat, but like something just popped into my head. 
about uh, using an IDE, does this um, um, does this either work with, like, let's say, Visual Studio, or does it work with, um, or does it circumvent any of that, or uh, how, how's I, I don't know how uh, Windows um, developers or because because uh, we've been kind of focusing on the admin aspect of it, so I don't know how this uh, how this would work. In so I'll I'll bring up the ISE, even though it's deprecated. Um, it's it's there by default on this Windows, um, but so the modern method is using VS Code um, and the the execution extension to bring your PowerShell session into VS Code. Um, basically, PowerShell ISE was the first version of that or the first iteration of that. Um, gotcha. Okay. So so it does. So you can bring in your PowerShell into yeah. Cause, so because I'm a I'm a Vim guy, so I'm kind of right. Yeah. <laughs> So it works just as you would expect, right? You can gotcha. see I can paste my code in here and hit the execute button and it logs in and then prints out my results and you can do all the same modification, all the same um, inside of there. Note that this is, um, because it's old, it's a uh, PowerShell, come on, PowerShell version table. Um, this is PowerShell version 5.1. So you see, I was using PowerShell 703 and the this other big one back here, um, and this is PowerShell version five, and it works equally well with both of them. Nice. Uh, let's see. When you create a service account, is that account related to the account in the container, or is it just used to give service access permission to the container? So service accounts are for providing uh, yeah, gated so access to the service itself. Um, so and that service could be a container or a series of containers, right? Yeah, so a service account, um, when you launch, deploy a, an application on OpenShift, a cert, uh, it uses the, the default service account, right? So there's there's a few default ones. There's one called default, which is the one that it uses at run, right? The service account that it uses to run the actual container. Mm -hmm. There's the deployer service account that, um, that basically is just the service account that is responsible for deploying your application. And I believe there's the build service account that is responsible to, if you're using S2I or just talking about S2I, to build your application, right? So when you create a service account, it's actually nothing happens other than the service account gets created. Um, if you want your application to run as that service account, you actually need to specify that in your um, either deployment configuration, your daemon set configuration, you know, what have you. So, um, so it just depends, right? So, uh, um, if you're going to give special permissions, usually when you create a service account, you're 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 giving special permissions, or you're either restricting or widening the default um, permissions of the default service account. So, right, depending on what you're using it for, right? So, like if I am, you know, doing if I'm creating an application that needs to do some admin work, I may have to widen the permissions. I don't want to touch the default one, right? Because that's like a global. <laughs> when I create a, a specific service account and attach it to a specific application. Um, right. So it uses that service account. Yeah. Cool. Oh, Thank so I, I remember to look at my sticky note that had the things I wanted to cover. Um, Good for you. So I, I've been, yeah, I know, it, with only 11 minutes to spare. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, you know, I've been logging in just using an OC login. If you want to use the kube config, you can absolutely do that. And yeah, you can do totally. it just just like you would expect inside of any of the others. Um, so all I've done here, I connected to my Bastion host. So this was the one that was used to provision the cluster. I'm looking at the kube config here. Um, so if I were to do a, a cat on that, oops, if I could type correctly, I'll get there eventually. Right, <laughs> I can copy all of, basically copy this file out. I don't have SCP on this um, or WinSCP mm -hmm. on this particular um, host. Uh, but I can copy that out and I can provide it into a number of different places. So if I do OC help and I do, um, or excuse me, OC options, there is this, um, it'll tell me where the default kube control or kube cuddle or whatever you want to call it. Oh, yep. There's a kube config, right? Uh, option, kube config. So equals. more or, or less. The default location is 
my home directory, C users Andrew dot kube. And I can mm -hmm. put that, even though this says HTTP cache, um, I can put the kube config file in there as well. And it will automatically ingest that and automatically use it. Um, so similarly um, to on Linux, you can um, put that anywhere you want. Um, so if you wanted to put it in your roaming profile, for example, so that you have those files everywhere you go, right. um, you can do that. And then you can put a, uh, uh, an environment variable that's, you know, kube config equals and the path to that particular file. Mm -hmm. um, so just like Linux, you can direct it over to anywhere that you want it to go. And then you can do that, you know, passwordless login using the kube config file. Also helpful for, Remember, if you're using that kube config file, you're connecting as the uh, system admin. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the useful ways of connecting when you might have accidentally locked yourself out of the cluster um, <laughs> or removed administrator access in other ways. Yeah. yeah. So like, or if your OAuth is failing, so like the right, OAuth, like... The, the OAuth um, runs as a pod, right? So there's, or, mm -hmm. you know, I guess collection of pods. If that is down, you may uh, may have to log in using this um, the uh, what we call a certificate method, right? So the this yeah this uh, this authentication I don't want to say bypasses OAuth, but it uses a different authentication method, um, not connected to OAuth. So um, uh, so yeah, so if your OAuth is having problems, this is how you would connect. You have a failure system. domain that involves your OAuth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so and note. As you all were, were talking there, um, OC debug, like connecting to the nodes, all that other stuff still works exactly as expected. Beautiful. So that's I awesome. Can, I can still connect in just, just like I need to. Um, you saw me SSH into a host. I, yeah. I didn't install SSH, by the way. SSH comes with the new terminal. Yeah. Nice. Like, is it open SSH or I have no fork idea. or something? Okay. We don't know. Okay. It, but it works. It's compliant. Seems to have all the flags that you need. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I don't I think Putty is on this host, but you saw I didn't use it. I just used no. SSH. Okay. Cool. That's awesome, man. So the put, yeah, the pretty, putty the putty guys must be crossed that they're not it's now included. SSH is now included in the <laughs> Well, it's about I, time. I mean, it's been an open standard forever. So like come on, right? Like hey, I'm happy just to have one tabs and two the a, a resizable interface that <laughs> behaves appropriately. Right. All right, all right. Yeah. Line wrapping. Good. It's good stuff. Yeah. Again, you can see, look, it, it wrapped the way it's supposed to. And mm -hmm. as I expand it out here, it fixes itself as it's supposed to. So very nice. I'm uh, yeah. You know, Microsoft is doing a lot of really interesting things, um, both in the open source world and with Linux as a whole. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I am excited and interested. Um, you know, you all know, I, I've talked about amongst our team before of, I could feasibly use Windows as my full-time desktop. Um, yeah, and yeah. I have a uh, Microsoft Linux yes. Tux here. Um, yeah, yeah. The Microsoft booth was giving those back when we had conferences. Yeah, um, back when we had conferences, there were yeah. <laughs> Microsoft Tuxes to be had. Yeah. Um, no, Microsoft has done a lot to get Linux working on Azure to get. Azure working, you know, better with Linux and has done an enormous amount of work in the open source world, uh, as well as working with us on getting OpenShift running in Azure. Um, so yeah, like we're super happy to be working with them now, like as equal partners. It's great. Yep. Now we just need to figure out how to get a, uh, you know, this, this Azure cloud shell. I just need an OpenShift cloud shell. Prompt inside. Ooh. Yeah, see, that'd be cool. That would <laughs> to get, be cool. Like, to, to get a cloud shell. Yeah, that'd be so that'd be really cool. Where do I put that when, request in? <laughs> when you're when you're bored this weekend, Christian, that's uh that's a yeah, that's a project out. for this weekend. That's there right. you go. Yeah, you don't have anything else to do. <laughs> All right. Anything else? With no more no more questions. It doesn't look like I don't think. Uh, just I double checking. Yeah. yeah. Last call for questions. Last call. You don't have to go home, but you can stay here. I mean, like you can watch, you, you can you can watch something else. Actually, you know what? Let's do a raid. You want to do a raid, guys? You can raid. Uh, yeah, you can raid. Let's raid the IBM, uh, IBM, the IBM folks. guys. Uh, yeah, IBM guys. Let's, let's doing see something. what they're up to. Uh, hang on, let's, let me get the interface here. Do, 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 do. Okay, so I, we've never done this before, but uh, we're gonna raid a channel, and that channel is going to be if they're still online, IBM developer. 
they're, no, not, they're not online. They're oh, not online. Ah, okay. uh, shoot. Okay, so I'll take requests, but it looks like we may, might have gotten another channel here. Has anyone, fa another question, I mean, uh, has anyone faced any challenges when adding a machine to your machine nodes and have they experimented with machine auto scalers? Uh, I believe, Christian, you have plenty of experience there, don't you? Yeah, so I'm trying to understand the question. Is it machine config like you're trying to scale vertically? Yeah, so there's yeah, so there's the the there's the machines, right? Or the uh, the machine um, machine sets that are actually as actually Andrew actually explained it pretty well on, on Tuesday, um, how to scale your clusters. So if I wanted to scale my cluster, I just add another machine and then if um, sorry, I, I scale the machine set, which then adds a machine, which then adds a node. Um, and then there's the machine config operator, which is used to manage the actual node. Um, Andrew kind of went through that a little bit on, on Tuesday. So if, 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 if you guys haven't checked out Andrew's um, um, operations or admin hour, I, OpenShift admin hour. I just yes. happen to have an AWS cluster up that I'll be using yes. for a, yeah. another demo this afternoon. Oh, uh, there wow. you go. So yeah. we can... We can talk about a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so the principle is, um, so machines are the representation from OpenShift Kubernetes to the underlying infrastructure as a service. So this represents the, um, or, or this, sorry, represents the, uh, in this instance, AWS virtual machine that, and how to interact with it. Um, whereas nodes represent the, that machine into OpenShift into Kubernetes itself. Um, right. So one of these is, hey, you are a member of my Kubernetes cluster, right? You're a node in my Kubernetes cluster. I need to schedule workload to you. One of these is, hey, you are a component of my cluster. I need to add or remove as the case may be. Right. Um, so there's two aspects to scaling machines um, or three aspects. So one, you need to be using an IPI deployment, right? Something with a cloud provider integration so that it understands how to talk to that underlying infrastructure um, and you know, do things like request new or destroy existing VMs. Right. Um, so the second thing is you need a machine auto scaler. And I'd also, I think it's, it's worth noting that that means that you're using DHCP. <laughs> we should call that out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you okay. for doing that. I really yes. appreciate that. Could you say that one more time? You need DHCP if you're going to do machine auto scaling. There we go. Yeah. So thank you. It's 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 an inside joke amongst us because we get asked all the time um, <laughs> if, if I can do IPI with static um, IP assignment. And no, I just want that out in the universe as much as possible. <laughs> um, so so the first thing I need is a machine auto scaler, and I define a machine auto scaler for each one of the machine sets in my uh, in my deployment. Um, so I, I haven't pre-staged any of this, so I can't. I'm not going to do this because I'm pretty sure it'll fail. Um, but essentially, you would want to create a machine autoscaler for each one of these machine sets. And these machine autoscalers you see represent the minimum and maximum number of machines from that machine set that it will manage. Um, so if you wanted it to scale all the way to zero, right, put a zero here. If you want it to scale to 100, put a 100 here. So the third thing that you need is a cluster autoscaler. And I'm going to completely forget where the cluster autoscaler is at. It is underneath administration, I believe. That's what I thought. Cluster settings. Oh, I don't remember where it's at. Uh, a dag nabbit. Um, cluster autoscaler. We'll go the old school way. There you go. Yeah, um, go with the CRD. Yes, yeah. yeah. all CRDs. <laughs> so a cluster autoscaler defines this, the size of the cluster as a whole. So if we look at our cluster right now, right, we have six machines or, or three worker machines inside of here. So you would say, I want my cluster to be between maybe one and 50 nodes. And what will happen is when a pod is unable to schedule due to an out of resource condition, mm -hmm. it will say, okay, I need to scale up. And it will select one of the machine sets that has an available capacity to scale as defined by the machine auto scaler and increase it. And that will result in machine API talking to the underlying infrastructure saying, hey, provision me a new VM, right? It boots up, it goes through the normal node joining process, et cetera. 
So where can that go wrong? Um, a couple of different places. Um, so one, if you don't have kind of all three of those things configured, in particular, both a machine autoscaler and a machine or a cluster autoscaler, um, and, and it won't trigger. DHCP. And, yes, and DHCP. So it won't trigger that. Um, won't trigger that to happen. Um, two, you need to make sure that you have a machine set or a, a, an autoscaler definition that has additional capacity. Right. If they're all maxed out, then it says I can't increase the machines anymore. Sorry. Um, so two, it could have issues communicating with the underlying infrastructure. Um, oftentimes we see this internally, um, like my AWS account is linked to our engineering team. Our engineering team, as you would expect, is doing lots and lots and lots and lots of builds, which means that often I get throttled. I'm a low important account. I get it. That makes sense. But it means that it can take, you know, what would normally take, you know, three to five minutes to provision a node can sometimes take 15 to 20 minutes because AWS is saying you're low priority. I'm throttling you until I, until an appropriate time. Right. Also, quotas is another. Um, yeah, you will hit quotas. Yeah, yeah. Qu quotas with your underlying infrastructure as a service provider. Um, if you change credentials, something like that, um, something happens to your credentials, your permission set changes, um, all of those, you can find those errors. If you go into the, as soon as I find what I'm looking for here, uh, if you go into the uh, machine API project, mm -hmm. which it was conveniently pre-selected, um, and then if you look inside of these pods, there'll be errors inside of here about you know why it can't talk to that underlying infrastructure. Okay, so here's, okay, Venu Vinay Kumar has responded uh, about his source to image issue. He's trying to build, created a build config, Java source code and URL, builder is wildfly, image stream tag of Java 8, and step nine and getting huh. issue is frustrating me. I can understand why. Yeah. I can understand uh, why it's frustrating yeah. you reading it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not found sub process exited status 127. Does Wildfly yeah. include S2I? I don't remember. Yeah, I don't. This is a, a, a Jason. This is a, one of the developers. So tell you what, definitely. email me cshort at redhat.com. I will get you an answer. Promise, um, and direct just do it like that. Now. Well, yeah, yep. we'll go direct. Yeah, uh, I'll get you an answer. That's the best I can do right now. I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it'll none be of a us good are answer. developers, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> none of us right now are developers. Right. Neither Chris nor nor me nor Andrew. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, but yeah. Um, so thank you all for joining. I really appreciate the time, Andrew. Thank you for updating the blog post and doing the video for everybody so you know people can come watch this later if they so need to and uh yeah 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 i have to go cool. join a very important uh kubecon booth meeting so uh That's likewise right. oh, I'm, yeah i'm on i'm on the same call so i guess i'll yeah. see all three of you yeah i'll see you in call. about uh 30 seconds <laughs> 30 seconds that's right bye everyone Appreciate bye thank it. you bye. all for joining, joining. we'll see you tomorrow yeah.